Hello everyone and welcome to another video. So today I want to continue our discussion on modeling dynamic systems and in particular I want to talk about going from a state space representation to a transfer function representation. So uh, just as a quick level set, remember if we had a state space representation of a system it's basically a, a dynamic model where you have inputs u and outputs y and that input output relationship is governed by your standard x dot is equal to ax plus bu, y is equal to cx plus du. So um, again remember we talked about state space representations pretty extensively in this video over here. So if this is uh, new to you, uh, maybe you might want to take a moment to pause the video and watch this video where we talk about how you get state space representations from ordinary differential equations. But if you're already familiar with that, we can now move on and start talking about um, another type of model that we also talked about previously, and that's a transfer function model in the sense that this is also another representation of a dynamic system which has inputs u and outputs y, just like the state space representation, it just has a slightly different model, right? And again, if the word transfer function is new to you, I would recommend pausing the video and watching this other uh, kind of quote unquote prerequisite video where we discuss what is a transfer function, how to make, uh, how to model them, how to generate them, and why they're useful. So in those two separate videos we just mentioned, we talked about state space models separately from transfer function models. And now what I want to do today is I want to go in one direction, say, what if we have a state space representation and I want to convert that into a transfer function representation. So we're going to do this one directional uh, transformation today. In some future videos, we'll talk about the backwards direction transformation as well. But again, for today, all I want to talk about is starting with the state space model and moving to a transfer function model. So um, if that sounds like more fun than a season's pets at Disneyland, why don't we jump over and get started? Okay, so let's start with our transfer function representation. Now, what I want to start with is let's go ahead and write the first portion of it, namely the dynamic equation, which is going to govern how the state of your state space representation evolves. And that's just the first top line, right? So this is your effectively differential equation, which governs how the state x evolves with time. Let's ignore the output equation down here for just one second, okay? So again, like, you, like we said, this right here, if you look at it long enough, if you just ignore the vectors and the matrices, this is basically like a, a first order differential equation, right? So hopefully um, by now, if you hear differential equation, uh, one thing that should probably pop to your mind of how I solve differential equations in a generic fashion is uh, use the Laplace technique, right? And again, if you are unfamiliar with the Laplace technique, I hate to keep doing this to you, but here's another video that I would recommend you watch first before uh, proceeding on because in this video talking about the Laplace transform, we go all over how to use the Laplace technique to solve differential equations. So I'm going to assume that you've seen that and I'm just going to apply that right here. So take the Laplace transform of both sides, right? So all we're going to do is just take Laplace transform, okay? of both sides. So here we go. This is a this is a single derivative. So we know that it's Laplace transform. It's basically what? It's S times the Laplace transform of the signal. So now I'm going to write this capital X of S. But then I'm going to have to make sure I account for the initial condition associated with this. So I'm going to write it like this, right? So here's the Laplace transform of the entire left-hand side, right? The S is from a single derivative. And then we get the this signal. So this is the single Domain, but then I have to subtract off the actual signal value at time zero in the time domain, right? So this was the initial condition, right? Maybe let's just write that down in red just to refresh everyone's memory. Here's the initial condition or IC, right? Okay, so that's the Laplace transform of the left hand side. Now let's do the Laplace transform of the right hand side. Okay, so again, pretty simple. A is just a static matrix, and then I take the Laplace transform of this signal, so I now get the signal in the Laplace domain plus B times this again is a time, uh, an arbitrary. Um, a time domain valued signal. So I take the Laplace transform and I obtain its signal right in the Laplace domain, right? So great, there we are. Now, uh, here's one of the things that we need to worry about or, or talk about. Remember, uh, unfortunately I erased the transfer function here because I need the board space here. But remember, we had a transfer function representation up here. And one thing that we talked about previously with transfer functions is that transfer functions ignore initial conditions, right? So I'm just going to write, TFs ignore 
ICs, right? So we're gonna have to make the assumption here that this here is completely zero, right? So let's do that. Let's assume that this is a zero, and maybe I should write zero bar, because that's a vector, right? Because X is a vector. So we're gonna assume all of the initial conditions of your state space, right? Every initial state here in this vector X, we're gonna make the assumption at zero. And again, this is the same thing we did when we were deriving transfer functions from ordinary differential equations. We had to make this assumption, and this is one area where a transfer function is somewhat uh, inferior to a state space representation, right? Because we lose this information, and this is exactly the step where we're losing it, right? Okay, if we're willing to lose that information, that's, that's, that's great, we can make some next steps. Let's take this term, move it to the other side, right? So what I can now write is I can say S x sub s minus a x sub s is equal to b u of s, right? Okay, now um, look at here, we have a common x of s here. Now the only other thing we gotta remember is that this is a matrix slash vector equation. So I have to be a little bit careful how I distribute or pull out this x. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull out the x on the right hand side and I'm gonna keep in mind that this is a vector or matrix equation, right? Remember, A, this is, an, this is, a, this is a square matrix, right? Um, B is also a matrix. We're dealing with matrices and vectors here so you got to be a little bit careful. So in other words, what I'm going to write is, I think everyone will believe me, hopefully, that this is the same thing. Si minus a x sub s is equal to b u of s. Okay, does everyone see what I did here, right? I just pulled out the x of s on the right-hand side. Therefore, I'm going to need to insert an identity matrix over here. I think if you stare at this long enough, everyone will, you'll be able to convince yourself that this is, that this is, this is correct, okay? Now, we're basically home free, because what I'm trying to do is I want to isolate x of s. So how am I going to do that? So again, keeping in mind that this is a matrix equation, what I need to do is I need to uh, left multiply by this matrices, matrix inverse, right, on both sides. So if I do that, I can basically isolate x of s. So what we're going to end up with at the end of the day is x of s is equal to this thing's inverse, right, s i minus a inverse b u of s, right? There we go. Does that seem reasonable, right? Again, all I did was left multiply by this thing's inverse, okay? So we end up with this expression. This is telling us effectively how the state of the system evolves in the Laplace domain, right? Now, let's box that up and uh, move to the next step, okay? Because I don't just want how the state x evolves, I want how the output evolves, right? I want to know what the output does, right? So let's go ahead and write down our um, output equation, right? So now we can consider the output equation, right? The output equation is just y of t, again, I'm just going to copy it, is equal to cx of t plus du of t, right? So this is not even an, it's not even a differential equation. It's just basically a static equation. So uh, what I'm going to do is take the Laplace transform again. And it's actually really simple to do that because, like we said, there's no, der uh, there's no derivatives in this at all. So we basically end up with, here, right away, y of s is equal to c x of s plus d u of s, right? Okay, so now, check this out. We already solved for what x of s is, so I am just going to insert that right here, right? So we end up with c times, what is x? x is that thing down here. c times the quantity s i minus a inverse b u of s. All right, and I gotta make sure I'm careful with the parentheses here, right? So this entire thing is x, right, that we just solved for. And then I gotta add on this term, right, plus d u of s, right? And I guess, whoops, I wasn't really careful with my <laughs> parentheses. Actually, I guess I don't even need this parentheses, right? Yeah, yeah, there we go, this is, this is fine. Yep, 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 yep. Okay, now, again, check this out. Look, u and u is right here. And again, we're gonna play the same trick. I'm gonna pull them out. Keeping in mind this is a matrix equation, let's pull them out on the right side. So we end up with c times the quantity si minus a 
inverse b and then plus d. And now I need to put some parentheses in because I'm pulling out u of s on the far side. All right? Would everyone agree that's the same thing? Okay, now, if you look at this, this is beautiful because the left-hand side is the output of the system, y of s, right? Now, if you look at this long enough, this is basically saying the output of the system, right? So let's draw the picture, right? The output of the system, y of s, is here. I have the input of the system, u of s, over here. Okay, and uh, what the transfer function is going to do, right? A, a transfer function basically tells us what is the output if you multiply it with the input, you get the output, right? That's this thing right here. Why don't I call this big quantity here, call this g of s, right? Because this thing in square brackets, it's some matrix that when I multiply the input by this matrix, I get the output, right? So this is basically my transfer function representation of the system. So let's just write that down. So G of S, right? This is a transfer function representation is this equation here. C times the quantity SI minus A inverse B plus D, all right? Let's box this up because this is effectively how to go from a state space, I'm gonna write it as SS, to a transfer function or TF, right? So there you go, it's, it's really simple. The second you have a state space representation, right? And the state space representation is parameterized by just these matrices A, B, C, and D, right? You've got that, you basically run it through this matrix equation here, and it gives you a transfer function, right? And we're basically, uh, we're, we're basically done at that point. That being said, I think we, it's worth mentioning and thinking about this again. Remember, we, we mentioned several times that these are matrix and vector expressions, right? So maybe we should come back. Let's do this in another color, maybe, right? Remember that A, let's say this is an N by N matrix, right? So in this case, there are N states, right? This matrix B, this is going to be an N by, let's call it M matrix. So this means there are M inputs to the system, right? So this L vector U, this has, this has uh, what do we say? It has a U1, U2, all the way down to UM, right? Okay. Um, and then let's look at this output equation here. Let's say that there are, uh, I don't know, let's call it P. This is a P by one. So there are P outputs. That means you have uh, a Y1, a Y2, all the way down to YP, right? That's, that's effectively like how many sensors you have on your system or how many outputs you have on your system. That's, that's, there's P outputs. So here's P outputs, right? So again, so what does this, this C matrix have to be? This has to be a P by N matrix. Right? And therefore, this D matrix has to be a P by M matrix, okay? So I think all that makes sense, right? That's the dimensions. Now, this transfer function representation, it's just a different representation of the exact, well, not the exact <laughs> same system here, but a similar dynamic system, right? It still has to have M inputs and P outputs. So again, this U here, it's still U1, U2, all the way down to UM. And therefore, and, and the output is also, it's a Y1, Y2, all the way down to YP, okay? So again, we better look at this from a dimensional perspective, right? So this, uh, this thing over here, this is going to be a P by one vector, right? The U input, this is an M by one vector. Did I get that right? Yeah, yeah, vector, right? So what does the dimension of G have to be in this case in order to make the, the, the uh, dimensionality work, right? This thing has got to be, right, a P by M matrix, right? So you don't get a single transfer function out of this representation. You actually get a P by M matrix of transfer functions. So in other words, what this G is gonna look like, right? It's going to look like a matrix where you have P rows, right? Let me, I'll maybe do it something like this. And then you have M columns. 
again, and I'm not gonna, something like this. So you're gonna have like a G11, a G12, a G13, a G21, G22, G23, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down to G M P, right, okay? So what do each one of these represent? If you think about this long enough, right, this first matrix, if you look at how the input outputs are going to work, right, you basically get the outputs by multiplying this matrix by the input vector, right? So what this first element is telling you, it's actually going to be the first output with respect to the first input. Right? And then this, this element here, this is going to be the first output with respect to the second input. And finally, this is going to be the first output with respect to the third input, et cetera, et cetera. You come down here, this is now going to be the second output, how it responds to the first input, right? And all the way down here to the, to the corner where you are going to get the mth output with res Back to, hold on a second. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Sorry, I, I, flipped, I flipped this index. Sorry, back up, back up, back up. This should be, this should be P by M, right? Because it is going to be the, it should be the pth output. Sorry, this is the pth output to the mth input, right? Okay, so sorry. Yeah, back up and switch your notes. This should be GPM is the last one. Yeah, because it should be number of outputs by number of inputs. Yep, yep, yep. There we go. Okay, right? So again, what makes this interesting is now you get this matrix of transfer functions. So again, if you if you think about this state space representation, you know, it might be your, like an aircraft, right? Where an aircraft, you have many control surfaces going in. You have ailerons, elevators, rudder, throttles, all that stuff. And then you have multiple outputs like airspace, speed, altitude, angle of attack, all that kind of stuff, right? Well, what this what this procedure is going to get you is going to get you a, tr a matrix of transfer functions where you can then find the transfer function of interest where you are looking for a specific output, how it responds to a specific input, right? Okay, so um, maybe I think the easiest thing to do is maybe we should look at a concrete example and see how this shakes out. All right, so the example I'd like to look at is uh, this DC motor. So if you remember in our previous video, we discussed modeling a DC motor using a set of linear ordinary differential equations. And we showed how you can get a state space representation of this DC motor actually, um, you know, fairly simply. And it turned out it was a three state system, right? So this system had three states, namely the position of the motor, the velocity of the motor, and the current running through the motor. And it had two inputs. It had the voltage you applied to the armature of the motor motor, as well as an external disturbance torque load that you could apply to the motor. That would obviously influence the system. So these were going to be the two inputs that we considered. And then we said from a sensor perspective, there were going to be three outputs of the system. And we, for, for, you know, for giggles, we decided to change the order. So the first output is actually the velocity of the motor. The second output is the position of the motor. And the third output of this system is actually the torque that the motor applies to the flywheel, right? So this was our model, um, and again, we discussed it in pretty extensive detail uh, how to get these this this state space representation in our previous video. Um, if you want to check that out and watch it, that sounds great. If not, for the purpose of this discussion, you can just think of this as just some state space representation, right? Which has this A matrix, this B matrix, this C matrix, and this D matrix, right? And this A, B, C, D basically gets us a state space representation that is uh, consistent with this state vector, this control vector, and this output vector, right? So so again, what we've got right now is we have our state space representation of the system where you have, like we said, this particular input vector coming in and this particular vector, whoops, excuse me, uh, coming out, right? Now what we want to do is we want to turn this into the equivalent transfer function representation where you have the exact same input vector coming in and the exact same 
output vector coming out, right? So again, we're just gonna go to our friend uh, that we just derived, and we're gonna say that, all right, the transfer function of this is nothing more than C times the quantity SI minus A inverse B plus D, right? And you can see, here's your A, B, C, D matrix, so all we need to do is just jam it into this expression and, uh, and turn the crank. Now, <laughs> as you can kind of see, this is not gonna be terribly fun to do because we've got a whole bunch of symbols here. This is gonna be a three by three inverse. We're gonna have to do a lot of matrix multiplies. So yeah, I guess we could spend the next 20 minutes on the board trying to do this by hand, but I'm lazy. So I'm gonna, let's, let's run over to Mathematica, um, a symbolic manipulation package where we can actually have it do this busy work for us. So um, let's do that. Let's run over there. And hopefully what we end up with at the end of the day is again, this G matrix, like we talked about, this is now going to be a three by two matrix, okay? So we're gonna end up with, let me just maybe just sketch this thing out, right? We're gonna end up with a G11, a G12, G21, G22, G31, G32, okay? And again, what this is going to tell us is all of these input-output relationships. So the first one, it's going to be the first output, right? But in this case, the first output is actually, it's theta dot, right? This is gonna be this with respect to the first input, which is this, right, which is VA, right? Then this is going to be the first output, again, which is theta dot, how it responds to the second input over TL, right? And then this is going to be theta over VA, and this is gonna be theta over TL, and then this one is going to be, um, what is this? This is gonna be, sorry, the third output, which is the torque, uh, produced by the motor, how it responds to the, the voltage applied to the motor. And then finally, this last one is gonna be how the torque on the motor responds to the external torque load, like that, right? So when we run over to Mathematica and do this and we get this entire, uh, we're gonna get a three by two resulting matrix, it's going to be this matrix. And then what we can do is we can pick out the uh, the entry of interest, like whichever one we're, we, we want to know about. So for example, if I want to control or model the speed of the motor using the, the voltage. Um, in fact, I think this is the example we probably want to use for the rest of the discussion is let's try to isolate this transfer function here, that one in the one, one element, which will tell us how the speed of the motor responds to the armature voltage, right? And again, you could do this analysis for any of these components. Uh, I just want to pick this because it has some interesting features and functionality that I think might be useful. So, um, okay, with that being said, let's run over to Mathematica and actually uh, compute what is this G, the overall G matrix, and then we'll extract out the G11 element. All right, so here we are in Mathematica, and just so you don't have to watch me typing them all in, I've already uh, entered in all the matrices here in Mathematica. Um, again, uh, one thing that might be interesting to discuss here is I can't just use A, B, well, actually, I could use the variable names A, B, but you can't use the variable name C or the variable name D. Notice here that when I just try to use C or D, these are, are black. So Mathematica already has these uh, reserved. For example, capital D is the uh, derivative or differentiation function. So I can't use that as a variable name. So that's why I tacked on this suffix of mat behind them. And same thing with C. I believe C is like a complex number or something like that. Long story short, I can't use it. So that's why I call them A mat, B mat, C mat, D mat for all of these matrices. So Again, let's go ahead and shift enter and get those into Mathematica. Okay, so now that we've got those defined, what we can do is just go ahead and use the uh, equation that we talked about earlier, right? C, S, I minus A inverse B plus D. So let's do that right now. So I'm gonna make a G of S, hey, oops, like that. This is gonna be C dot uh, inverse of the quantity S times, uh, okay, identity matrix. Mathematica's got a real nice identity matrix. This has to be a three by three identity matrix, right? So there's the SI minus A. There, inverse. Okay, then I need to matrix multiply with B. And then I just need to add the D. Like there, there you go. That is what it is. Um, maybe let's, for giggles, let's go ahead and simplify this. And uh, like we said, this is gonna be a matrix. So for example, if I shift enter this right now, you see I get a big matrix. Uh, maybe it might be easier to look at this in matrix form. So let me go ahead and put a semicolon here and let's look at this in matrix form. Um, again, if you need a little bit of refresher of playing around with uh, matrices in Mathematica, I've got a separate video discussing that. Um, okay, here we are. So we've got, uh, like we said, a 
three by two matrix, uh, which describes all of the transfer functions between all of the different inputs and all of the different outputs. So now what we're interested in is I want the transfer function between the first output, which we said was the velocity of the motor, and the first input, which was the armature voltage. So we want to grab the one one element of this transfer function matrix. So I can do that right here. Here's the one one element. Let's maybe call this GV for velocity, right? So this is the transfer function which tells the velocity uh, or which describes the velocity, right? So there you go. Here's what it is. It's just this element right here that we extracted. And as you can see, what's interesting is you can kind of see it's a second order uh, transfer function, right? There's two S's in the bottom. In fact, why don't we write this in a slightly, let, let, let's expand the denominator a little bit. So maybe what I'm going to do is let me grab, uh, well, I'll maybe make a, a note here. Let's expand the denominator to uh, better understand the characteristic equation, right? So let's grab GV and let's grab the denominator of GV. So that's the bottom. And then let's expand the whole thing, right? And if we do that, you see, yeah, I do see, uh, yeah, second order. And in fact, let's go one step further. Let's collect all of the like terms of S. So maybe what I'll do is let's go ahead and wrap this again with a collect. Whoops, collect. Let's collect powers of S and S squared just to manipulate this a little bit more easily. And there we go. You see, it's clearly a second order transfer function, right? So if you expand the denominator, you end up with, well, I guess we can write this out. Um, so at the end of the day, right, we have, whoops. Okay, so GV of S, right? It's basically this numerator that we had earlier over this denominator. So I'm just gonna copy and paste this just so we can, so I don't have to run over to the whiteboard and, <laughs> and do, okay, it's something like this. And I guess, you know what, we could, we could make this in descending powers of S just for giggles, just so it looks a little bit more standard of what people are used to seeing. Okay, something like there, right? So here we go. It's a second order transfer function uh, that we extracted. Now, um, we did all of this in Mathematica. Let's go and see if we can use MATLAB tools to do something similar. All right, so we've got MATLAB fired up on this side. So let's just go ahead and see if we can use MATLAB to convert a state space representation to a transfer function. So the um, first thing I'm gonna do in MATLAB, obviously, since I don't have the symbolic uh, math toolbox installed is um, I can't do like I did in Mathematica and just leave everything as symbols. I need to define constants. So um, again, all of these numbers, we talked about them in our previous video where I was discussing the modeling of this DC motor. Um, again, if you really don't care, just think about these as just constants that describe things like the, uh, the electrical machine constant, the mechanical machine constant, the inductance of the motor, the damping, uh, the moment of inertia, all that kind of stuff. Here are just some numbers that uh, make physical good sense. So once we've got these defined, I can just go ahead and define that exact same state space representation that we did earlier, okay? And then what I've got down here is, uh, first thing I'm gonna do is I am going to try to make a transfer function, which is uh, the transfer function of the velocity that we obtained in Mathematica. So again, this is literally exactly just me copying what we did in our Mathematica notebook over here, right? So you can see the numerator of the transfer function is just KT. The denominator is, here's the coefficient of S squared, right? It's this J M L A S squared. Then this is, oh, whoops, sorry. I just noticed, whoops, in our Mathematica notebook, I missed, huh, this is a constant term. Sorry, I should have moved this to the end. Hold on. Let me, let me cut this. This should have gone over here to the, yeah, because this is the constant term. Sorry, let me, let me just rearrange this just so everything is, Okay, there we go. <laughs> so this right here is the coefficient of S, right? So again, here it is in MATLAB. Here's the coefficient of S. And then finally, here is the constant term and here's the constant term over here, right? Okay, so again, I'm just gonna use the TF function to make a transfer function um, using this array of numerator and denominator, right? Uh, okay, so let's F5 this, we'll run this, and here we go. Here's the transfer function representation um, uh, in MATLAB, right? Now, notice this took a little bit of work. We had to go to Mathematica to compute what the transfer function was. MATLAB actually has a much easier, quicker way that we can basically directly take this 
state space representation and turn it into a transfer function. So that function is called SS2TF for state space two transfer function. So if you look up the help on this, it says exactly what we want to do. It is going to take the state space and turn it into or convert it into a transfer function. So now you see you pass it A, B, C, D, and then you gotta give it this fifth argument, which it's actually optional, it's I, U. So this is, you have to tell it which input do you want? Because remember, we talked about how what's coming out of this is if you have a multi-input, multi-output uh, state space representation, you still are gonna have a multi-input, multi-output transfer function representation. But MATLAB is going to force you to basically pick a single um, input and then it's, it might return actually a vector of outputs for you. So long story short, I feel this is very clunky to have to use this IU. So what I actually prefer to do instead is I prefer to actually go to my state space representation, this one back here, and I like to isolate the row of the B matrix, which corresponds to the input that I care about, or sorry, the column of the B matrix that I care about. And I prefer to isolate the row of the C matrix that I care about. And then again, the associated um, element of the D matrix. So long story short, what I wanna do is I wanna trick MATLAB into basically thinking I have a single input, single output system and just get the transfer function for the only thing I care about. I don't need the entire matrix. Right. So in other words, what I mean by that is let's do this slowly by hand. So now let's say um, obtain the same TF using MATLAB's SS2TF. OK, so again, what I'm going to do is I am going to isolate which column of the B matrix do I care about? So in other words, which input do I care about? So I'm gonna call this IU for the index of the uh, the control I care about. So I care about the first input, right? So this is the first input, which was VA or the armature voltage. And let's also look at which output, which index of the output do I care about? Again, this is the first one. So I want the first output, which was um, velocity, right? Which is theta dot, okay? So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna call SS2TF, okay? I'm gonna pass it the A matrix. And now in this B matrix, I don't wanna give it the entire B matrix. I wanna give it the column of the B matrix, which corresponds to um, the input I care about. So I'm gonna say all rows column IU, right? Does that make sense? And then similarly for the C matrix, I'm not gonna give it the entire C matrix. I'm gonna give it the row corresponding to the output I care about and then all columns. Right, And then likewise for the D matrix, I'm gonna give it the appropriate element. So in this case, it's I, Y, I, U, right? There we go. So now what this is gonna do is I'm basically giving the SS2TF function, I'm giving it a single input, single output system. So now what we have out here, maybe I'll call it GV num uh, alternate or something like that for a second way to get this numerator and then a second way to get the denominator is I'm gonna use SS2TF, right? So does this line make sense, right? What we're doing here is we are tricking MATLAB into thinking that this is a single input, single output system. So there should be a single numerator and a single denominator, right? And then that's great. So what I can now do is I can say, all right, I'm gonna go ahead and say GV alt is TF of this and this. Right? So now, hopefully, theoretically, GV and GV alt are the exact same transfer function because really, realistically, that is exactly what we're doing, right? We're basically looking at the transfer function between the motor's velocity and the armature voltage. So the physics is the same, so numerically, this should hopefully work out. So now, if I go ahead and run this, and we inspect them, you might say, uh, wait a second, something doesn't look right. Look at this, here's GV. This was a second order transfer function. And now GV alt, or the one that we got using MATLAB's SS2TF, this is a third order transfer function. Something seems a little bit fishy here, right? Well, if you look at this long enough, you can basically see that what's going on is MATLAB hasn't done the pole zero cancellation. Look at this, there's a, there's a, there's a zero at the origin down here. And clearly in the denominator, 
there is also a pole at the origin. So we just need to cancel these two things out. So there's a real nice way to do this. There's a function in MATLAB called minreal. And again, we actually, I actually have a completely separate video discussing minreal and how to use it. And we will look at that a little bit later. For now, what I just want to say is let's just use it to basically perform some of this, as we said, pull zero cancellation, right? So really what I want to do is I need to come over here and I need to say, um, let's just go GV alt is min real of GV alt, whoops. There we go. So this is like the cleaned up transfer function where we've done some of that numerical uh, cleanup, right? So now if I run this again, you see, okay, great. Originally in Mathematica, uh, we got second order and now we have a second order uh, using MATLAB's SS2TF. However, you stare at this again and you say, wait a sec, these two are not the same transfer function, right? They're numerically different. Look at the numerator. This, this one here is 0 0.098. This one down here is four to the E to the uh, four, you know, like this is significantly different. But again, upon closer inspection, what's going on is actually, um, <laughs> you can see one of them has the uh, a constant of, of one, a coefficient of one here in terms of the S squared, and this one doesn't. So by the time we factor all this out, hopefully they should line up nicely uh, and, and should be the same thing. So to prove that to yourself, there's actually a couple other very helpful functions in MATLAB that I think are useful for when working with transfer functions. And we might want to discuss here just because we're, we're, we're wanting to convince ourselves that these are the same. So one of them is TF data. So TF data, if you look at this, it's going to basically get you information about the transfer function, okay? The way I like to use TF data is I like to use it with this V argument because what this does is this is gonna rip out the numerator and the denominator of this transfer function object. So let's do that down here. Let's just go ahead and say, extract the num and den of GV and GV, the alternate version, right? So uh, I don't know, let's call it num1, num, uh, whoops, sorry, den1. So this is the original one. So let's go TF data of GV, and I'm gonna pass it that V input so that I get them as a vectors. And then let's go num2, den2 is TF data GV alt V. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm ripping off the numerator and denominator of those two. So again, let's just run this and you'll quickly, well, I guess maybe not quickly, but I think you can see that this is the numerator of GV, right? That 0 0.098, here it is, 0 0.098. And then the denominator, all of these coefficients are all of these coefficients here, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we basically have extracted them. And now what we're wanting to show and prove to ourselves is that really these numerators and denominators are representing the, the, the exact same transfer function, all right? So one helpful way to do that is there's a function called TF2ZPK. So this is a transfer function to zero pole um, gain because really that's all the transfer function is, right? A transfer function is a list of zeros, a list of poles, and a potential gain in front of them, right? So if this numerator and denominator yield the same zeros, poles, and gains as this numerator and this denominator, I think we should be in business, right? So what we can do is let's do this and say, check that both, uh, come on, I wish I could type, that both uh, num and den pairs correspond to the same uh, zeros, poles, and gain, right? So what I'm gonna do is let's go TF2 ZPK, and I'm gonna pass this thing num1, den1, right? So here are the zeros, the poles, and the gain from the original system, from, from the Mathematica, from the analytically derived transfer function, right? And then I'm gonna do the same thing and look at the zeros, the poles, and the gains that we get from MATLAB's SS2TF, right? So now, if we look at these, let me semicolon these to get them off of the command window. Now, hopefully these zeros, these poles, and these, whoops, that should be K2, there we go. Those all line up. So if I run this, let's look at them. Let's look at, how about Z1 minus Z2? Uh, 
there, okay, yeah. <laughs> Actually, that makes sense because there are no zeros, right? Z1 is an empty, Z2 is an empty. That's because the transfer function has no zeros, right? You can clearly see there's no S's in the numerator, okay? Now, let's look at the poles. P1 minus P2. Look at that e to the minus 12. So yes, these things have the exact same poles. So transfer functions GV and GV alt have poles in exactly the same location all the way down to machine round off precision. Now let's look at the gains, K1 minus K2. Aha, look at that, exactly zero. So yes, I think I'm very confident that this, at this point that MATLAB's SS2TF calculated the correct transfer function um, once we go ahead and do this, this minimum realization and the pole zero uh, cancellation. So, um, so there you go. Here's a quick handy way in MATLAB to basically take a state space representation and turn it into a transfer function representation and manipulate it if you, uh, if, if you think you need to do that, okay? All right, and tell you what, uh, one more thing. While we've got everything in MATLAB all defined with all of these variables, let's go ahead and fire up a Simulink model and just go ahead and verify to ourselves that, yeah, these two representations are the same, the transfer function and the state space representation. So um, I think the easiest one to start off with is obviously the, uh, the state space. That's the original one. So I'm going to come here and grab a state space block. I'll drop that in. And uh, what we can do is just go ahead and define this as the a, uh, whoops, come on, A, B, uh, oh, geez, I hate this interface sometimes. It tries to be too smart for its own good. C, D, okay, like that. Great. And we will leave the initial conditions as a uh, as three zeros, right? So again, one single zero means really a vector of three zeros in this case. So here is the original st state space representation. Maybe let's write that down. Let's call this the original state space representation, right? And now we got to remember that this thing had two inputs and three outputs, right? So maybe what we should do is let's get ourselves a mux okay like this okay and this has two inputs right it has u1 which was va and it had the second input which was u2 which was the external torque load right and then similarly on the output side we should demux this there should be three outputs because this was a system with three outputs so let's just maybe expand this a little bit and uh, maybe get the, oh gee whiz, I wish this wire would play a little bit nicer. Okay, there we go. Here we go, there were three outputs. So the first one was uh, theta dot, right? That was the, the motor's speed or velocity. And then the next output I think was, um, what do we say, Y2 was theta. And then finally Y3 was the actual torque produced by the motor, right? Now, I don't need these Y2 and Y3, so let's go ahead and get terminators and just disconnect or, or connect them to there. There we go, okay? And now, what we want is, I want the transfer function, I want to know how the system responds from this input U1 to this output Y1. So, let's just go ahead and make maybe a step input right here, maybe, yeah, sure, a time one, Let, yeah, let's just make it a unit step, and then for now, what we need to do is assume that the constant second input is zero, okay? So now, this really is a single input, single output system, right? So again, let's put a scope attached to this, okay? And now, if I just run this, since we already defined A, B, and C, this should probably just run no problem. So, here we go. If I bring open the, over the scope, we see here's the response of the motor to a one volt step in armature voltage. So apparently it spins up to around, I don't know, almost 10 radians per second, right? Now, what we want to do is ask ourselves, is that transfer function representation that we just calculated the same thing? Uh, does it give us basically the same response? So let's come over here to Simulink and grab a transfer function. And what I would like to do is get GV, right? We said this was G11, which was basically the uh, theta dot to VA, right? That's what this was, um, uh, the transfer function. And we obtained this via the C times SI minus A inverse times B plus D equation, right? So now what I can do is if I go ahead and grab, what do we call this? Uh, yeah, here, GV num and GV den, right? So let me go ahead and put that here as the numerator and the denominator as GV den. There we are. 
Okay, and now what we can do is I can put in the same input over here to both the original state space representation and this transfer function representation. So this here should also be y1, which was theta dot, right? So maybe what I should do is maybe let's put these two, uh, I'm gonna combine this so we can see both of these on top of each other. So I'll put another mux like this. So we can compare these two outputs. So the top one is the response computed by the original state space representation. And the bottom one is the response computed by the transfer function, right? So if I run this, and look at the scope, look at that. They lie wham, bam, right on top of each other, right? So we see that, yes, in this case, this transfer function is the same thing as this state space representation for this particular input to this particular output, right? Now, the thing we gotta remember, right, is this is assuming all the other inputs are zero. So for example, if this first, or excuse me, if the second input was non-zero, so I don't know, let's make up some number. How about minus 0 0.2 or something like that? You put this in. Now, this state space representation, it's going to respond to both the step in armature voltage and the second input. So, I expect this output now to be very different than this one down here. So, if I run this and I go ahead and look at the scope, we see that, yes, indeed, they're different. So, if I wanted to be able to capture, uh, using the transfer functions, how these two, um, or how the system responds to both of these inputs, I actually need G11 plus G12, all right, in order to compute this, this output, okay? But I think that's the story for uh, another discussion. So this, if we set this back to zero, I think proves that in this situation, right, this transfer function does indeed Per, uh, behave the exact same as the original state space representation. Now, the last parting shot that maybe we should say is if you remember this state space representation, this was a three state system, right? It was a third order system, right? And we saw that by looking at the size of A, right? A was a three by three matrix. But now if we look at the denominator or if we look at just GV, right? The transfer function is a second order right? So again, this is interesting in the sense that although this state space representation is a three state system, the response from the first output to the first input, that actually is only a second order dynamic system as evidenced by our resulting transfer function representation is just second order, okay? So um, again, I'll leave this as an exercise to the reader to think about why that happened, right? Uh, and again, a little bit of a hint is one of these states, right? I think the, the, the state vector was theta, theta dot, and the current, right? And if you think about that, theta is actually a direct integral of uh, theta dot. So that has something to do with it. But again, like I said, I'll leave this as an exercise to the reader. Um, so I think this is a good spot to leave it, at least in terms of MATLAB Simulink. Uh, keep this model in mind. We are gonna be adding to this uh, as we go through and discuss um, the opposite transformation about going from a transfer function back up to a state space. But again, that's also a discussion for a future video. So again, I just want you to keep that on your radar. Um, don't let this slip out of your mind. We will be revisiting this uh, model in a little bit. All right, so let's just recap what we've discussed today. So we said if you start out with a state space representation, we can basically turn it into a transfer function representation using this, uh, I'm gonna draw it right now as sort of a one directional arrow, right? Where you basically go and say that the transfer function is nothing more than C times the quantity SI minus A inverse B plus D, right? So that's how we went from a state space to a transfer function. Uh, in our immediately following video, what I'd like to talk about is what about if you want to go the other direction? What if you have a transfer function and you want to turn it into a state space representation? So we're going to cover that next. And just to set the stage as well, this is sort of uh, one part of a larger picture of translating between state space, transfer function, differential equations. There's a lot of different models of differential and dynamic systems where we might want to be able to freely move between all of them. So we're going to be talking about that in the future as well. So uh, with that being said, uh, I think this is probably a great spot to leave it. I hope you enjoyed the video. And if so, I also hope you'll consider subscribing to the channel. Um, if you just scroll a little ways down and click on that subscribe button, surprisingly, it really does help me continue making these videos. And remember, the new videos come out every Monday. So I hope I'll catch you at one of these future discussions and we can all learn something new together. So until then, I think I'm going to sign off. Talk to you later. Bye.